All right, I'm going to start. Uh, my name is Beth Breslauer, and in addition to managing member relationships, I head up GBC Health's activities in the technology sector. I'd like to welcome you all to the social health session. I don't think there's any topic that better aligns with our conference theme, Defining Forward. We live in a world that's fundamentally more interconnected than ever. The internet and mobile technology have radically changed the way we work, socialize, play, and manage our lives. As our capacity to connect with each other in the virtual world expands, so is our ability to affect our personal health and global health at large in unprecedented ways. For example, video technology is allowing medical researchers separated by great distances to collaborate face-to-face -face and accelerate medical breakthroughs. We're seeing a paradigm shift in the doctor-patient dynamic driven in large part by the internet. The number of disease-related websites and social networks is growing rapidly, enabling patients to learn, share their experiences, and provide support to one another. Facebook just jumped into the health game, launching a feature earlier this month that allows users to easily join the organ donor registry. Over 100,000 Facebook users registered within the first 48 hours alone. Companies are even integrating online gaming into their workplace wellness programs. Competition could be the key to driving positive health behaviors. Having developed a panel and a publication for the M Health Summit last December in collaboration with our members HP, Deloitte, Vodafone, Novartis, and others, we were very excited to continue to explore the intersection between technology and health. And our original concept for this session was to provide an overview of social media's impact on health. But as we dug deeper, we decided to expand the theme to allow us to talk about technological connectivity more broadly. We could have devoted an entire day to this topic, but unfortunately, we only have an hour. And I've been told we might have less than an hour because you can't keep <laughs> Mutar kept waiting. So our format is a little bit different. Rather than a panel, we're, giving, uh, we're going to see the stage to four fantastic speakers who will each cover a different topic along the spectrum. Before we begin, I would like to thank Cisco for sponsoring this session. Cisco is a Business Action on Health Award winner in the Application of Core Competence category, and we are thrilled to have him on board. And coincidentally, our first speaker is from Cisco. So we want to begin the session with a high-level view of the technology and health landscape. Cisco is well known for their technology products that enable connectivity and real-time collaboration. Carlos Dominguez, SCP, uh, SVP at Cisco and technology evangelist, will share how technology is changing the way we communicate, collaborate, and care for our health. And he'll also provide a glimpse into the future, sharing some new technological advances that will have an impact on the way we approach health and more. Please welcome Carlos Dominguez. Good. A lot of coffee? We need coffee. It's that time of day. So I'm going to kick it off, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, the future of health and really how do you leverage technology to change the world in which we're living in. There's a lot of change going on. I don't think anyone would argue the fact that uh, our world is changing extremely rapidly thanks to technology. So I want to kick it off by talking about an old Chinese proverb that says, may you live an interesting time. Actually, this was not a good thing. When you heard this in the olden days, this is actually the first of uh, three curses. It's the less severe of the three. But in my context, it's not a curse. I think we are living in incredible times that are really changing the landscape of every aspect of our lives. I think uh, society, I think government, and I think every single business is changing on account of technology. So we're going to look at it positively. I'm going to explore three quick things with you. I'm going to talk a few trends that are going on, some of the applications of how we're applying technology, and last but not least, I'd like to give you a little glimpse into the future as to what I see is coming. So first one is the trends. So there are four things that are really being quite impactful. Number one is we're starting to get much more powerful devices that are portable, right? And we're carrying them in our pockets. We have them on tablets, et cetera. That's changing everything because the more powerful devices are, the more applications and new things we can do it. The second thing is we have a tremendous uh, proliferation of internet use users in the world, and I'll sh be sharing that with you in a moment. The speeds are getting faster, and again, we're having more rich media coming into these devices like video. So let's explore these four a little bit more. By 2015, there are going to be over 3 billion 
users on the internet. And that's, that's really great because as we think about providing services, as you'll hear from my fellow colleagues and speakers that are coming, a lot of it has to do with having connectivity. So that's a good news story. The second thing is mobile penetration is increasing exponentially. As you can see, there's tremendous mobile penetration in, in a lot of the, uh, the world. And uh, again, there'll be over 10 billion mobile connections by 2016. So, you know, we're going to be pretty well wired and we're going to be uh, very mobile. The other thing is the speeds are going to get faster. As faster speeds get there, it enables new applications to be developed. And I think those are things that are really important. And then also, because of these connectivities, two thirds of the United States will be mobile data traffic, of mobile data traffic will be video by 2016. So you're going to see the speeds increase in the applications that we're going to be carrying around. A lot of it is going to be video based. It'll be a, a, a moment in time where how we speak uh, and how we connect will be video, both at home, on the go, and also at work, as we've seen already. Uh, social media penetration, as you'll hear, and was the topic we were kind of considering. Uh, doing for an hour is very, very pervasive. As a matter of fact, uh, Facebook is going public this week, right, just to keep things in, in check. But we still, as many people that are connected, I still think there's a lot of room for growth. And this also could be uh, the game changer in connecting people and changing behavior. One of the things that's important to think about is expectations from users. Yesterday's solutions are enough. Customers want to be taken care of at any time, in any location, on any device. And we're starting to see that more and more. We have to you know, kind of adjust to some of the demands and some of the trends that are going on from the user perspective. And a lot of the trends are really in support of that. So there's a technology palette if you're a technologist. And I'm sorry the slide is so busy. But you know, we have a palette in which we can play with, which for us are really tools. There are tools of breakthrough ideas and research like neurointerfaces or 3D printing that's emerging. You hear a lot of talk about that. There's a lot of stuff that's in early deployment, right, that's cutting edge, like big data, RFID, virtual reality, augmented reality. All these things are really coming into play. We also have things that have been mass adopted, right, like gaming or tablets or video. And we're learning how to use them. The world continues to evolve in applications. We have a lot of technologies that are transformational. An example, mobile internet or social media that when they hit and we start using it, changes society and changes behavior. And then we have a lot of things that are what I call recombination, where we take social media, we take, uh, for example, gaming and location-based services and mobile and put them together and are able to create some very interesting things, which I'll share with you in a moment. So this is our palette. It depends on where you are. Some of the things I'll talk to you about are available now. Others are emerging. But this is kind of what we play with when we develop stuff. So some of the applications that are out there, video, right? The doctor will see you now. It, not necessarily in person. We're starting to see a lot of applications where remote healthcare is actually being provided by video. Um, you know, there'll be the future of health. Well, you'll have remote diagnostics. We have a, a center at Cisco and, and a lot of internet connected devices that we can actually have a doctor remote for where the patient is and leveraging video and leveraging these tools, we can actually do some diagnostics. Uh, there's also this whole thing of uh, having remote diagnostics with a lot of devices. There's incredible a plethora of devices that are being developed in this sector, right, for, for remote diagnostics to be delivered. Uh, because these devices are there, there's not too far to think about having, you know, do-it-yourself uh, checkups, right, leveraging the tools and the technologies that are available. And a lot of it will be reusing platforms that we have in mobile, et cetera. Uh, there's also tracking. RFID, incredible, right? In this particular example uh, put out from the great folks from PSFK, it's really around you know, medications. There's RFID tags. It's connected to an application, and it's starting to track. This whole RFID movement will be very, very impactful, especially as we go global into s some of the remote villages and stuff where you know, it becomes very, very difficult to track. RFID can really bring a lot of value in those spaces. Gaming for health. I don't know how many of you have one, but I have this Nike fuel band, which is transformational, right? This is a very simple sensor that's connected to the internet, and it creates a, a gaming platform. And the example I'll give you, two nights ago, I have to hit a goal of 4,000. That's the number of activities that I have to calculate to. And I was in bed at, 12, at 11.32 at night. My wife is fast asleep, and I realize I'm only at 3,700. So what did I do? Any gaming person would do? Got out of bed, put my sneakers on shorts, went for a run until I hit 4,000. So it's actually altered my behavior. Why did I do it? I had a streak of 21 days, and I'm competing against five of my friends who's going to win. So I wasn't going to lose 
you know, on that one. So just very, very interesting how a band on my wrist connected to gaming, connected being social, is actually altering my behavior. And those are things that we need to be very well, well aware of. And this is what it looks like, right? You start getting goals. It lets you compete. It's tracking distances, steps, and a variety of other things. There's going to be more and more sensors that we will be wearing on our bodies. So the healthcare industry will be transformed. Thanks for the, uh, the amount of technology that we're going to be wearing. Uh, and again, a lot of other sensors like Fitbit and all the other things that exist. Uh, the other thing, too, is assistance uh, may not be real. They may be virtual. And there's a tremendous benefit for some of these things. For example, in uh, pre-screening or pre-interviewing somebody before seeing the doctor, we have discovered that a virtual assistant, they're more willing to talk about things that might be sensitive that they, would, they feel uncomfortable telling a real person. They do want the doctor to know, so they tell a virtual assistant. And those are really interesting applications. It's also becoming, uh, these assistants are becoming much more lifelike uh, with the processing power, with all the digitization and, and virtual reality that we can create. We can actually create assistants uh, that are really, really interactive and really lifelike, and that's kind of out there. So what does the future bring? Well, a number of different things. So you know, one of the things is, is holograms. And this is a, a, a very simple, uh, uh, futuristic view. This was done uh, by our friends at Corning. And what you're basically seeing is a, a display that you know is interactive. This is someone remote in another place of the world with a patient there. They have two doctors basically collaborating with each other, right? And although this is a little bit futuristic, we have a lot of these point technologies now. And uh, they're, you're gonna see a hologram take place in just a moment. I demoed a hologram five years ago uh, where I brought our CEO, John Chambers, from Brazil. Uh, I'm sorry, I was in Brazil, from San Jose, California, to a, a place I was presenting in Brazil. As you can see here, they're scanning, and they're doing all sorts of different things, and what they're able to do is after that image is scanned, there'll be a virtual table where that patient could be viewed by doctors. As futuristic as this sounds, this is probably within the five to 10 year horizon. Uh, and when you start doing things like this, it'll revolutionize everything. We'll be able to slice and dice and be able to do all sorts of things. So keep, keep your eyes out for that. Uh, this is an example of me in uh, Georgia Tech, actually with, a, uh, with an EEG cap. And what I'm doing there is I'm actually controlling the activities of a dolphin on a computer screen through thought. There's no more. We've seen, you know, Siri is voice activated. We've seen things like Kinect on the Xbox 360, which is gesture based. And now we've got, you know, brain control. Think if you can't speak or you can't move because of some sort of injury, you're able to control a wheelchair or maybe control some sort of device through thought. Not that far out either. It's within the five year uh, horizon also. Some tests going on. We've seen a lot of things with printing, whether it's, uh, you know, printing an aircraft engine, which we printed at the, one of our conferences last year. Uh, we took something from a design, actually had these printers, and we printed this device. We put it together. But there's also a lot of work, I've just seen in TED and other places, where they're actually printing organs, you know, still in very preliminary stages. Uh, they actually printed an esophagus and were able to transplant it. So a lot of really cool and innovative things happening in that field. Uh, virtual reality, another one that's uh, really cool. Uh, the cool thing with virtual reality is that these immersive experiences they're discovering that actually alters behavior. I went through a VR simulation of uh, cutting a couple trees down, and they told me that if I start using this recycled toilet tissue, which was a painful commitment, uh, you know, I would save two trees. And then they made me cut two trees down. And what ended up happening is there was a spill that happened. Instead of using all the napkins, I used one napkin and kept running back and forth to the sink. When they asked me, why were you doing that, Carlos, I said, I don't know. Right, so it altered my behavior by having that VR experience. I think there are five realities to remember. Healthcare is becoming borderless. It's no longer defined by a physical building, and we're bringing that out. The second thing is the patient experience always matters and will matter more and more into the future. I think we can deliver better healthcare for more people at lower cost by leveraging technology. You'll see that the barriers will be broken. I think we need to continue to focus on some of the regulatory barriers uh, that are always uh, experiencing because technology is always before regulation and we got to break through them. And last but not least, whatever we dream, I think we can make. So, you know, I ask you all to dream very, very big. So thank you very, very much.
Carlos. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Robert Kirkpatrick. He's the director of UN Global Pulse. Global Pulse was created by the UN Secretary General in 2009 to explore opportunities for using real-time data to gain a more accurate understanding of population well-being, especially related to the impacts of global crises. Robert will show us how data is being used to, de to de detect the signs of stress on vulnerable populations and track human impacts of crises as they unfold. He'll also introduce you all to a new form of corporate philanthropy that I know you'll want to be a part of. Welcome, Robert, to the stage. Thank you. Carlos' point, I think perhaps the, uh, the modern version of that Chinese curse is may you have to figure out how to keep your industry running halfway through a global paradigm shift. Um, so Global Pulse is an innovation lab based in the Secretary General's office at the UN. Uh, um, we are looking at uh, new phenomena we haven't had to confront before from an international development standpoint. Some of you may remember this very picturesque volcano. You know the one with the amazing name of Eyjafjallajökull from Iceland. It uh, shut down air traffic all across Europe for weeks on end. Um, had friends who were stranded in Paris and couldn't get back to work for weeks. What you may not know is that within four days after the eruption, 5,000 Kenyan farmhands lost their jobs. Anybody know why? Exactly. 500 metric tons of fresh cut flowers flying to Europe every single day. And there's no social safety net in Kenya when you lose your job. The problem is, of course, that with the internet revolution, the mobile revolution, and the social media revolution, we've connected our societies and our economies in ways so complex we no longer understand, and in real time, which means a crisis in one part of the world can emerge, reverberate, and begin impacting vulnerable populations before we know what's happening. Our challenge is that we're still using 20th century tools, more, by and large, to track development. We think of it as something you can take a snapshot of every couple of years to see where you stand. But that means today we're finding out what started happening two years ago, too late to act. Some of the, M the MDG indicators we care a great deal about are three to five years out of date. How do you use that to make decisions? But now populations everywhere around the world as the digital divide closes are you know, generating data just by going about their daily lives as they buy and sell goods, as they search for information, as they use social networks. So we figured if the private sector can understand its customers in real time using these kinds of analytics, why can't we understand when people are getting sick, when they're losing their jobs, when they're struggling to afford food or medicine? The idea is pretty simple. When people's needs change, they change how they use services. And these leave patterns in anonymized data that could be used to understand faster what's going on while there's still time to act. A couple of examples wanted to take you through. This is research from East Africa, from Tanzania and Rwanda. Basically, at higher income levels, you'll see somebody buying $10 worth of airtime credit all at once on their mobile phone. When they lose their job, you see a pattern of them shifting to 20 or 30 or 50 cents every few days. So we think there's a real opportunity here to monitor this type of data from mobile phone networks anonymously for trends where you see people sliding down the slope. Something's going on in that province you need to find out about. On the other hand, if you see people moving up, perhaps your program is working. This is research from Telefonica, the largest mobile carrier in Latin America. They found that you know, at lower socioeconomic levels, people are calling you on your phone because they know you can't afford to call them. But as there's more economic activity going on in your life, there's more coordination, which means you have more relationships in your calling network where either you or I are equally likely to initiate the call. You can pull that data out of a mobile call uh, records database and use this to track what's happening. Twitter, 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 Twitter. That is 24 hours of tweets in Jakarta, Indonesia. They are, by some measures, the third or the second largest user of Twitter in the world. Um, you can tell they spend a lot of time tweeting stuck in traffic because you can drive by that map. Um, we started looking at food security through Twitter. Turns out people tweet a lot about food and they tweet differently about food when they're not eating. That's Ramadan. At the start, they're tweeting a lot about what they wish they were eating and at the end, they're busy eating and so they're not tweeting. Um, but it turns out to be quite interesting because, in fact, if you simply count the number of tweets mentioning the price of rice, Indonesians eat more rice per capita than any other country in the world, um, you get a pretty good curve fit with the official food price inflation statistics. 
did I mention that that's free in real time as opposed to collected from 25 cities every month? We looked at World AIDS Day in Indonesia and the US actually from in both 2011 and 2010. This is really interesting. You can see that conversation about HIV doubled, almost tripled year over year, and the amount of conversation about testing and counseling nearly doubled. So if I were responsible for an HIV awareness campaign in Indonesia, I'd be pretty pleased with that result. We've come a long way in crisis mapping from John Snow's 19th century tracking of cholera in London. A uh, recent article in uh, the um, Journal of Tropical Medicine and Health showed that had Twitter been mined in real time during the cholera outbreaks in Haiti, it would have given a two-week lead time on detection. Uh, we need to be doing this systematically in the future. And then, of course, data was actually used, anonymous data from mobile phone carriers in Haiti to track population movements outside of Port-au-Prince to predict where the cholera outbreaks were going to appear. This is the poster child, right? Google flu trends. People change their online health-seeking behavior when they or a child get sick in their household. There's enough search data coming out of Indonesia now that they can use this for dengue. We got interested in this. We said, well, you know, how broadly can this behavior monitoring uh, be used? And we started looking at migration, right, which is, of course, related to health. Turns out you can see here that people in Germany, sorry, people in Spain at the beginning of 2011 suddenly began searching for jobs in Germany. You can see Trabajo in Alemania showing up as a search. We know what's happening in Spain now. And then below you see worldwide searches in Arabic for work in France. We think the first two spikes are seasonal and agricultural, but when the economic crisis hits at the beginning of 2008, it takes off and doesn't come down. We started looking at sentiment mining as a tool for understanding different phenomena in social media. Sentiment mining is basically scoring for emotional tone, the nouns, verbs, and adjectives people use to talk about online topics. This is what companies do to talk about their, to see how people are talking about their brands before and after an advertisement is put out. So we looked at sentiment about work to see if we could actually predict unemployment spikes. And then we looked at topics after people lost their jobs to see if we could um, understand how job loss was affecting people. We found tens of thousands of blogs and forum posts where people said, I lost my jobs today. We looked at Ireland and the US as a starting point. In Ireland, five months before you lose your job, there's a spike in anxiety. Um, and then two months after that, there's a spike in confusion. And then people lose their jobs. And after that, three months later, they start canceling travel plans. We think it's a really interesting possibility here to track these kinds of changes in well-being. Um, in the US, we don't get confused or anxious. We get angry and depressed. And afterwards, we're talking about downgrading our, downgrading our housing and having to take the bus. So it's different from country to country. Now, none of this data replaces the kind of you know, carefully validated statistical uh, survey data that's already used around the world, but we see it as complementary. We think there's a very powerful model we can draw on here from public health, from uh, you know, syndromic surveillance. The idea is understand a baseline of how people use these different services and then monitor for anomalies. Where we see these anomalies appear, there you can form a hypothesis that something you need to know is going on. You don't know whether it's health related, whether it's the crops have failed, but you know something's happening. And the idea would be then maybe to use crowdsourcing to reach out to community health workers, radio station hosts, youth volunteers, and ask what's happening in your community. Are there food shortages? Are people sick? It's a way to move from early detection to early response and then continue to monitor so we can have a better understanding of the impact of the response. And here's the issue. There's a lot of data on the open web that we can use in social media, but some of the most powerful real-time data sources that can tell us where people are in trouble, where they're coping with crises, are not public. They're being collected behind corporate firewalls by corporations who provide these services and used to compete. So we've been engaging with the private sector, asking, is there a way, not for you to share your raw data, that would put you out of business, but to share analysis of the data, either some subset of your information or simply mining you know, the data behind your own firewalls for patterns that we learn together that you need to be looking for and alerting us when those patterns appear. 
And it's been remarkable. The companies we've engaged with have gotten very excited about the idea, and they don't just see it as another form of corporate social responsibility. They recognize that by not sharing this data, it, it's, there's an opportunity cost for public policy that ends up essentially creating a bad business environment. You know, if your customers that you're counting on to subscribe to your services and buy your products fall back into poverty, and no one knew it until it was too late, and it was your data that could have been used to prevent that, you've created business risk. We have to figure out a way to move to a real-time data commons that includes the private sector. So that's what we're working on. If you're interested in working with us, um, we're looking for partners in academia and private sector who are willing to uh, roll up their sleeves and start exploring these new opportunities in real-time analytics, and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. We're now going to dive a little bit deeper into social networks, social media, and health behavior change with our next speaker, Douglas Story. Doug is Director for Communication Sciences and Research at John Hopkins Center for Communications Programs. He has 30 years of experience in social and behavior, behavior change evaluation and strategic health communication. He'll lend some insight into the relationship between traditional offline networks and interactive social media, and he'll share some examples of how Johns Hopkins is leveraging social media programs to, to promote health behavior change. Doug? Thank you, Beth. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today. I, I'm not a technology guy uh, or a data maven. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist trained in communication and behavior change, and I work mostly in developing countries. So one of the challenges that we face is taking some of these exciting opportunities in new media, uh, new information processing, and translating them, translating them into forms that can work at, uh, at the developing country level. Um, CCP, the uh, Center for Communication Programs, does about $100 million of uh, behavior change communication work in 30 countries around the world every year, including um, uh, work on a variety of strategic communication programs, strategic communication uh, um, uh, activities that uh, have as part of their component work with the private sector on the production of media programs, research, community outreach, uh, and social marketing of healthcare. Sorry, never. There we go. Sorry. Um, social marketing of healthcare products included. Uh, and what we're finding is that social and interactive media are becoming an increasingly important part of those strategies. <clears throat> Dating back over 150 years, but especially since the publication of Everett Rogers' landmark book on the diffusion of innovations in the 1960s. The behavioral sciences have discovered a great deal about communication within and between social networks and how that process affects the adoption and sustainability of health behaviors, particularly through the effects that networks have on shared experience, social support, and the creation and maintenance of social norms. This knowledge has been widely exploited for health promotion through the mass media and community-based intervention strategies for many years, but research on social networks has exploded in the past 10 years, as you see in this graph of social network citations in PubMed. What's new that's catalyzing a lot of this research interest is the way that new interactive social media are changing the ability of people to form groups and participate in social networks. The affordability of these media and the decentralization of control over the creation of content means that anyone with a smartphone can not only text their doctor, but record a song or make a film or a video and share their story with the world on the internet. Anyone can become a producer of health messages, and health messages can be more easily personalized and targeted to specific user groups. This has profound effects on the production of health in ways that allow health communication to both go big, uh, sorry, to both go small, that is to, to personalize information in a way that, that individuals can relate to, as well as to go big with media, that is to achieve scale by reaching millions of people quickly. Communication research tells us that 
Information spreads quickly within social groups or clusters of people, through networks of, in, in neighborhoods, through clubs, through work groups, much as a cold virus spreads through a community. But recent online simulation work by Damon Santola at MIT has showed that information, as well as all of the other things that groups confer, like social support, social influence, and social norms, spread differently than disease. It diffuses, information diffuses most rapidly when social groups are clustered, but also socially connected with each other through bridges. That is, people who belong to one group, but somehow know someone in another group. Information is shared and reinforced within groups, but then leaps to a new group through the social bridge. And this is exactly what the proliferation of social media has made possible. They enhance people's ability to connect with people both within and outside their own social circle. Now, CCP works globally, but I would like to highlight four projects. Um, I'd like to highlight four projects from Sub-Saharan Africa where some of the best cutting edge work in social and behavior change communication is happening today and that illustrate ways that social media can help improve the impact of behavior change communication. In South Africa, a locally registered affiliate uh, called JAHISA, the Johns Hopkins Health and Education Group in South Africa, works with the South African Broadcasting Corporation to produce one of the most popular television shows on the air right now. Intersections is a television serial drama with an underlying HIV AIDS prevention storyline. It features a cast of characters who have never met each other, but whose lives are interconnected through a network of sexual relationships. Intersections takes advantage of social media to extend the reach of the TV series and helps to personalize the intervention through a website and links to Facebook and a Twitter feed where viewers can learn more about the show and the characters that they identify with who model desirable behaviors. Um, they can also contact a doctor with their own health questions and connect with other viewers. Intersections maintains a Twitter feed that allows fans to share their own reactions to the series and personal stories about dealing with AIDS, a couple of the comments of which you see here. In Kenya, the Tupanga Project, Tupanga being a local name for the Kenya Urban Reproductive Health Initiative, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, in, to, under Tupanga, CCP works with another Hopkins entity, Japigo, and a local communication NGO called The Well Told Story to produce a comic book series and community radio programs all backed up and linked by Facebook, Twitter, and an SMS platform that helps foster a young adult community committed to safer, healthier living. All communication activity is branded with the Tupanga concept. Last month, the Tupanga Facebook page registered 565 new fans and almost 49,000 page views, which was up 17% from the month before. In Ghana, the USAID-funded Good Life program is an integrated health program covering family planning, nutrition, malaria prevention, maternal child health, and water and hygiene. And among the intervention strategies that help Good Life connect with its audience and help audience members connect with available services are a popular game show on television and Facebook discussion groups. Here you see some recent posts from members of the Good Life audience asking about how to participate in the show, how to get tested for malaria, and where to buy insecticide treated nets for malaria prevention. Recently, a Good Life musical PSA on malaria prevention featuring the Ghanaian national football team singing the Ghana cheer song went viral on YouTube, generating 30,000 views. And finally, in Mozambique, the Chova Chova HIV Prevention Project provides an SMS platform in partnership with a local cell phone company that allows the program to interact directly with its community radio listeners in order to reinforce behavior, enhance self-efficacy to get tested and prevent HIV, and support information seeking, which is often a critical first step in behavioral decision making. 
So in conclusion, I just want to say that interactive social media are clearly changing the way that traditional health communication behavior change programs are implemented. And they increasingly are an important role in integrated communication strategies by virtue of the way they allow internet, uh, the, the way they allow audiences to connect with each other and with the program. And there's a critical role for the private sector to play, as the panelists in today's opening session may, uh, indicated very clearly. Private sector partners are needed to do a number of things to help expand connectivity, particularly in low resource settings, to support the production and dissemination of content that can operate across multiple communication platforms, to advocate for local media and corporate involvement in health promotion, and to support tie-ins to programs that promote commercially available health products like insecticide-treated bed nets, health services, food supplements, hygiene products, and pharmaceuticals. So I hope you'll consider getting involved in some of these emerging initiatives that leverage the power of new and emerging social media. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Our final speaker is Dr. Ferris Tamimi. He's the medical director of the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media. The center's goal is to accelerate the adoption of social media for health-related purposes starting at Mayo and then within healthcare more broadly. Through this work, Mayo Clinic looks to help improve health literacy, healthcare delivery, and population health worldwide. Farish is going to share a few stories with us that illustrate how patients are now driving not only their own health, but health research as well. And this may be the only session you'll ever hear that includes both spontaneous coronary artery dissection and baseball. Here we go, Farish, please. Thank you. I promise to get everyone to lunch in a timely fashion. So I, I want to start by building a framework for our conversation. I think you've heard from all three speakers that everyone is online. And I think all of us knew that. But not only the online, they're spending more and more time, as you've heard, in social media platforms. In the US, social media bypassed porn in 2010. Anything that's beating porn is doing pretty darn good from a marketing perspective. One in five minutes spent online globally are spent in social platforms. I believe our moral obligation as healthcare providers is to meet our patients where they are. And where they are is online. And it's not ROI, return on investment, it's risk of ignoring that we face. Healthcare discrepancy is not only access to a doctor, it's access to information. So I believe we need to put the information in the hands of the consumer as they seek health, wellness, and walk with them on that journey. I'm gonna give you a couple of cases of that. I do case studies because I'm a cardiologist. But I want you to build this in the framework of how we view this from healthcare social media. This can either be transactional, which is sort of level one, putting good content in the hands of a consumer, or conversational. And there's value in both. I have a four to five year old. Every spring we see our pediatrician, Aaron. Aaron tells us how to pick a bike helmet. It's gotta be a Y over the ears. It's gonna be flat on my forehead. It's gotta go one finger breath beneath Eva Everett's chin, right? That's a three minute conversation. Think of the value if I film that conversation and put it on our YouTube channel, people who can't get to the pediatrician. How many lives would I save in my community, in my world? So transactional isn't bad. Transactional is powerful. The point is you've gotta be there. Let's talk about that. So I wanna tell you two stories. This is the UT ligament split tear. This is Dick Berger, who's one of our hand surgeons. Dick described an unusual kind of ligamentous injury. So in most ligament tears, it tears rips asunder. In this ligament tear, it tears along the long axis, like a strip of celery breaking. It's very hard to see on MRI, has subtle physical exam findings, but if you can identify it and go in and remove the inflammatory debris, stitch the ligament back up again, immobilize, you can heal 95% of people. If you don't know about it and don't identify it, it can be debilitating. When I first came out of medical school, which was looking at my scalp a long time ago, it took 17 years from a discovery to be half popular penetration, 17 years. This one, 24 months. This is Jason Wirth. Jason was a baseball player in spring training and was struck by an errant pitch in the wrist. Horrible wrist pain. He went through steroid injections. He went through surgery, he went through physical therapy. He was to the point after 18 months he was going to quit playing baseball. He was going down to the post office and one of his neighbors who was a physician said, look, 
If you're going to quit, why don't you head up to Minnesota for a second opinion? Let Dick Berger visit with you. Dick saw him, documented the classic physical exam findings, operated on him the next day. Three months later, Jason signed for $850,000 with the Phillies as an extra outfielder. So our goal is to share these stories, not purely for marketing, but because there's power in sharing good content. So we filmed Jason with a Cisco flip camera, love that camera, and we had him tell his story in his words. And, and there's power in that, in a patient telling their story in their words. We posted that on our Sharing Mail Clinic blog, which is our blog for sharing with patients who are, or patients, or potential patients or past patients. And then Jason hit two home runs to drive the Phillies into their second consecutive World Series. So we wanted to share this story further. So we actually were able to get it, get some traction with our local newspaper, the Rochester Post Bulletin, which did a story on him. KLTV, which is our local news station, used our flip video for on-air broadcast. Now that's good content being placed in the hands of the consumer. It was picked up by USA Today, who did a, a health care story upon it. Now, that's transactional. Our goal is to make it conversational. So when USA Today posted on their web page, we asked them to embed, to embed a widget for a Twitter conversation. So for one hour, you could talk to Dick Berger about your breast pain, about orthopedic issues, about UT ligament tear. Now that brings us to Erin Turner. So in this photo, Erin is 28. She's had five years of debilitating wrist pain, to the point she cannot open a jar of spaghetti, she can't lift a Brita water bottle without significant discomfort. She's to the point that she's thinking about wrist fusion, trading permanent disability for permanent pain. Her mother told her about this Twitter chat, and as a product of participating in that chat, Erin, who lives in DC, felt she got enough information to understand her diagnosis, enough data to make a decision, and felt comfortable coming to Rochester for a second opinion. This is from her blog post. Less than 24 hours after my initial appointment, I not only had a new diagnosis, a UT split tear, but had surgery to correct the problem. As I write this, my right arm is in a festive green but otherwise annoying cast. The short-term hassle ever should be more than worth the long-term gain, the potential for a future without chronic wrist pain, a future that without Twitter and those in the medical community willing to experiment with the new communication tools might not exist for me. See, in my era, it would have taken almost 20 years. But online, with an empowered, engaged consumer, this took two. This is a photo of, of a season opener with Jason and Aaron comparing their wrist scars. And I was born in Tennessee, so every story's got to have a happy ending. This is Jason signing the 13th richest contract now in MLB history for 126 million, seven years with the Washington Nationals. And I share this story not because I want you to feel good for Jason, although I hope you do. I share this because our obligation is not just to put the information in our consumers' hands, but to meet them and educate them where they're at. So I want to share a second story. That was practice and knowledge diffusion. This is research. This is SCAD, spontaneous coronary dissection. It's a rare syndrome characterized by an abrupt tear that occurs in the lining of the coronary artery. It peels away. Behind the tear, a blood clot forms closing the artery off. It's devastating. We know very little about it. It occurs in young women, usually of childbearing age, can cause death, debility, heart failure. At the, at the time, at the largest series we have in the literature is 48 patients. And this is Katie Leone. Katie's 38 in this photo. She's just had her second child, and she's fatigued, and she's short of breath, and she's tired. And she goes to her doctor, her doctor tells her what I think any of us would have, you've earned the right to be tired, you've earned the right to be short of breath, you should be fatigued, you have two toddlers at home. But then Katie gets chest pain, and she goes to the emergency room, she's told, you've had a heart attack. We don't know that much about this. It's called SCAD. You're lucky to be alive. We don't know what the prognosis is. We don't know what this implies for your children. So put yourself in that position. What would you do? You'd go home. You'd assume you're living on a time bomb, and you'd get online to get information. So she went to a peer-to-peer -peer group called womensheart.org and posted, all the SCAD ladies, put your hands up. And there she met a variety of women with SCAD, including Laura Haywood Corey. Now, Laura and Katie decided, you know what, this is BS. We've got a lot of patients here in this virtual meeting ground. Why don't we make someone study us? Let's not wait for them to come find us. Let's go find them. 
So they looked online, found a women's health conference coming up in Rochester, and drove to Minnesota with a plan to coerce someone into studying them. And they confronted Sharon Hayes, and they basically said, we want you to study us. Now, Sharon isn't particularly interested in SCAD, but she recognized this was an opportunity to meet an empowered patient where they were. And she said, you know, this is interesting, but is this useful? Can we do this virtually? Let's try a proof of concept. Let's try studying 12 patients. Can we just get 12 together through a virtual, a virtual repository? So she decided to apply for IRB approval for 12 patients. The same time she got approval, which was March 18, 2010, she started a SCAD clinic because she knew if we started studying them, they would come. And she wanted to make sure that we had medical genetics, OBGYN, available to see those patients. She got approval March 18th. The same day she got approval, Katie and Laura went home. And before Sharon could post a recruitment ad, they had identified 18 patients. So that's great, but the proof is in our ability to deliver the data we need to make a decision. Within six months, we had full angiograms, echoes, medical records on 18 patients. I'm, I'm sorry, on 12 of the 18, because we were approved for 12, including patients from the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada, and the US, none of whom came to Rochester, Minnesota for care. Now, it would have stopped there, but the women in the SCAD support group, through blogs, through tweets, through Facebook, continued to send recruits to us. So we're now on track to set up a 200 patient bioregistry and a 400 relative DNA biobank that allows for the first time to understand this rare disease. And this isn't something we sought. This is something that patients wanted us to do. They're the ones who recruited. They're the ones who drove this conversation. And that's the transition that's occurring. This has been written in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. It's also been published in the Wall Street Journal. We've started a, a, a group to try to identify and explore this further, it's similar to the Social Media Business Network. We have 100 hospitals across the world that are participating with us to try to identify and understand how to meet our consumers where they are and give them what they require. And I'll say it again, this is a moral obligation for healthcare providers to be a part of this conversation, not to sit on the sidelines. I tweet on Twitter. I pin on Pinterest. That's my email address. I blog on a weekly basis. Thank you. Thank all, of, thank all of our speakers, this is amazing. And I know it probably felt a little bit like speed dating, so um, we don't have time, unfortunately, today for Q&A, but some of our speakers will be staying with us through lunch and through the conference. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, I also wanted to do one shameless plug before we go to lunch. Pick up your copy of the M Health publication that we worked on together with HP, Novartis, Deloitte, Dahlberg, UNICEF, Tech for Dev, and and many others, Chevron also contributed. Um, it gives a lot of practical advice on building partnerships in general, so it's even helpful for folks who aren't building partnerships in the M Health space. I want to thank you again. Thanks to our speakers, and have a great lunch.